Welcome to Hatman Strikes Back Daily Boxing News. So Frank Warren has signed yet another heavyweight. In this case, it is two-weight world champion looking to become three-weight world champion, Lawrence O'Colley. That's right. He is signed to Queensbury Promotions. So there's some quotes here I can read you. This is from Lawrence O'Colley. He says, There is only one place. If you are a heavyweight in Britain or the world, it is the Warrens. They've got the best up-and-coming heavyweights, the best current heavyweights, and the best who are on their way out. So it is the place to be for me. And there's some comments here from Frank Warren. He says, I am thrilled to add Lawrence to our burgeoning heavyweight ranks here at Queensbury. I fully expect him to increase our success in the marquee division. Lawrence possesses all the attributes to make a big impact at heavyweight. He will relish being released of the burden of cutting weight, allowing his natural talent and power to shine through. There are so many exciting fights and options out there for Lawrence, and I am so looking forward to getting him started again. And some more comments from Lawrence here. He says, It has gone through different phases in my career. I needed to find a home that would cater for this next period, right to the end of my career, which is the heavyweight dream of being a three-weight world champion. All right, those are the words of Lawrence O'Colley. Now, I guess the first question people are going to be asking is, why did Frank Warren sign Lawrence O'Colley? Because he isn't known for being particularly exciting. Okay, he's got a reputation for being a jabber and a grabber. And on top of that, he, in the minds of most people, doesn't stand much chance of really doing much at heavyweight because there are just so many danger men out there. And if he got mauled by a little guy in Chris Billum Smith down at cruiserweight, then how on earth is he going to avoid that same fate, but even quicker in the heavyweight division? Obviously, he went the distance with Chris Billum Smith. We'll get to that. But first of all, let's have a look at Lawrence O'Colley's record here. So he's 20 and 1, 15 KOs, 31 years of age, 6 foot 5, 82 and a half inch reach. So in terms of height and reach, he's plenty big enough for the heavyweight division to have success and what have you. He's also still relatively young in heavyweight terms. And he's coming off that knockout win over Lucas Rosansky. That was at Bridgeweight, but it was still an impressive performance. So, you know, he's got a little bit of momentum behind him. Now, obviously at Cruiserweight, I mentioned the Chris Billum Smith loss. Prior to that, he was unbeaten and he was coming off a win over David Light. I'm not sure David Light is even fighting anymore because I think he suffered some type of brain issue. I don't think it was like really bad whereby he had to have surgery or, or anything, but I think there was some kind of issue with David Light. Anyway, before that, it was Michael Sislak. He beat him on a 12-round decision. Then he fought a guy called Dylan Praskovic, stopped him in three. Then it was the fight where he won the WBO Cruiserweight title against Christoph Klovatsky. That was a really good performance and an entertaining performance. Lawrence O'Colley is, as I say, often accused of being boring and awful to watch. And on several occasions, he definitely has been that. But this was one of the occasions where he was actually decent to watch against Klovatsky. And also, his last fight against Rosansky was only a one-round fight, but that was decent to watch as well. So he moves up to heavyweight. And when he relinquished his Bridgerweight title a few weeks ago, he requested that the WBC give him a relatively high ranking at heavyweight. And they have granted his request. You can see the heavyweight rankings here. The WBC. There's Lawrence O'Colley in at number five. Below him, we'll talk about who is above him in a second, but below him are the likes of Anthony Joshua, Fabio Wardley, F.A. Jagba, Bakadir Jalilov, Frank Sanchez, Philip Pergovic, Luis Ortiz, Otto Wallen, Deontay Wilder, and a guy called Murad Aliyev. I'm not familiar with him. Now, if Lawrence O'Colley is genuinely looking for a title shot, then maybe somebody would select him as a voluntary defense because he is a two-weight world champion. And so on paper, for a guy to fight Lawrence O'Colley, it might look good. The fans wouldn't like it, but historically, people in the future who are just looking at boxing records and they've never actually seen two or any or many Lawrence O'Colley fights, they might just look at it, you know, give it a cursory glance and say, oh, wow, he beat a two-weight world champion there, you know, this uh, heavyweight, whoever it was. So 
from that perspective, you could see why somebody would want to give him a voluntary defense. But on the other side, if they want to make the maximum amount of money from pay-per-view revenue and what have you, they probably wouldn't pick Lawrence O'Colley as their opponent. But again, it all depends on who the champion is and whether they think that Lawrence O'Colley's style would suit their style. Because if it's a guy who's going to box, they probably wouldn't want to pick Lawrence O'Colley as an opponent. But if it's a guy who's like, let's say, a Martin Bacoli, who's going to come forward and maul you, if he was champion, I'm sure he'd fight Lawrence O'Colley in a heartbeat, <laughs> you know, as in pick him for a voluntary. So I don't know whether Lawrence O'Colley wants to wait around and hope that somebody picks him for a voluntary defense or if he wants to try and fight his way to mandatory challenger. That will be very, very difficult in the WBC, as you can see here. He isn't yet ranked by any of the other sanctioned bodies. It's just the WBC, again, because he's a two-weight world champion with them, former. And you look above him, Jelly Zhang. How many of you guys would pick Lawrence O'Colley you know, over Jelly Zhang? I certainly wouldn't, okay? I think Zhang would be far too big and powerful. I wouldn't pick O'Colley over Martin Bacoli. I'd give him a better chance against Caballel than the previous two, but I still wouldn't pick him against Caballel. Obviously... What I think and what you think is irrelevant to Lawrence O'Colley, okay? He's not basing his moves on what fans think in terms of who they think he could be or not be. And that's the right thing for him to do. He's not supposed to listen to fans, right? He needs to believe in himself, trust his team, trust his own judgment, so on and so forth. But as an outsider looking in, just as a boxing fan, I look at the top five at heavyweight and I think, I can't see Lawrence O'Colley beating any of these guys. And obviously Tyson Fury, but he's going to seemingly fight Alexander Usyk. Hopefully nobody pulls out. So yeah, but here's the thing. Lawrence O'Colley has made some comments regarding the weight cut, not only for uh, cruiserweight, but also bridgerweight. He says he was having to cut weight to get down to bridgerweight. And that heavyweight, he's going to be much stronger and, you know, he's going to be more confident. And I think one of the reasons that Lawrence O'Colley used to clinch so much is because he got anxious when an opponent got inside his reach. And, you know, he, I guess, maybe wasn't confident that he could take their shots when they got up close. And also the fact that he isn't the best when it comes to inside fighting. So it's a combination of things, I think. If he's stronger at heavyweight and maybe feels he can take a better shot at heavyweight, Will that mean that he doesn't clinch as much? We shall see, hopefully. But what I can say is, if he tries to clinch against, let's say, a Zheli Zhang or a Martin Bacoli, even a Caballel to a lesser extent, he's not going to be able to do it. These guys are too big and too strong to get wrapped up by Lawrence O'Colley. See, that's one of the things that Lawrence O'Colley had to his advantage at Cruiserweight is that he was so much physically stronger than his opponents that when he decided to wrap them up, they couldn't do anything about it. Whereas these guys will be able to do something about it. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. Lawrence O'Colley moving up to heavyweight. I don't know how much belief he has that he can become heavyweight champion. I'm not saying he doesn't have a lot of belief. I just don't know, genuinely. And, you know, there's the possibility that he's maybe just looking for paydays rather than has genuine ambitions to become a world champion. I mean, would he go in there against Daniel Dubois? Dubois is obviously IBF champion. Would Lawrence O'Colley do that? Maybe he'd need to fight somebody in the IBF top 15 to get a ranking with them, although these sanctioned bodies seem to make up things as they go along. You know, as soon as one of the champions, you know, if they like a particular champion, if he's generating money and what have you, yeah, they'll just randomly rank somebody in the top 15 who's never even had a fight in the division before. Oh, they've done that many times, sanctioning bodies. Remember when uh, Canelo Alvarez fought for his first world title, 154 pounds? It was against Matthew Hatton, who'd never fought 154 pounds before. Never mind beating any contenders in that weight class or within the ranking of that division. So, yeah, sanctioning bodies have been doing nonsense like that for years, but maybe a colleague who has sparred Daniel Dubois in the past would look for that. I don't know. Now, I remember the stories of them sparring back in the days, and the word was that Lawrence O'Colley got dropped or knocked out by 
Daniel Dubois sparring. And st stylistically, it doesn't seem like a good fight for him. You know, a guy who's going to be all over him like that. It might turn out like the AJ uh, Dubois fight, but even quicker. That would be my estimate. <laughs> you know, that, that would be my best guess as to what would happen there. So you guys let me know what you think. I know a lot of you are going to say, I don't care what Lawrence Sokoli does. I don't care that he's ranked in the WBC top 15. No, I don't care. Couldn't, I've got no desire to watch any of his fights. Many of you are going to say that and that's fine. I get it. <laughs> you know, he's put on plenty of uh, stinking displays in the past. But for those of you who are somewhat interested, particularly after his performance against Rosansky, let me know what you think. Can he actually do some damage in the heavyweight division? And can he beat anybody above him in the WBC rankings? Now, rankings are determined by a number of factors. And so you don't necessarily have to beat somebody above you in the rankings in order to take their spot. If they have been really inactive and you fight someone, let's say one or two spots below you, that could be turned into some type of eliminator, not necessarily a final eliminator, but some type of eliminator, a ranking match, then you might be able to move above them. So let's say that Zhang can't find anybody to fight and he's been inactive for eight, nine months and a collie fights, I don't know, a Jagbar and wins. I'm not saying he would beat a Jagbar or not, but let's just say hypothetically that happened. They then might, as in the WBC, move Lawrence Okoli up one spot and Zheli Zhang down one spot or more. You see, sometimes rankings are like that. It's dependent on activity, who you've beaten lately. And the thing I really don't like is giving former champions priority in the rankings, which they really haven't earned. Yeah, that happens a lot. Obviously, Deontay Wilde has lost several times now, so he's been dropped down properly by most of the sanctioned bodies, if not all of them. In fact, the other sanctioned bodies don't even rank Deontay Wilder. It's only the WBC who he was champion for several years ago now that have given him a ranking. He's number 14. So, you know, he's dropped down. Anthony Joshua's dropped down, obviously, but he still had a really high ranking up until relatively recently. But, you know, he sees number seven with the WBO, number eight with the IBF, and with the, uh, oh, he's not actually ranked by the WBA at all, even though he was a WBA belt holder in number six with the WBC. So, yeah, when they rank these former champions, like, for example, best example here, Tyson Fury being ranked number one by the WBC, two by the WBA, one by the WBO. For me, that's ridiculous. Tyson Fury hasn't had a win in the past 18 months that would validate this higher ranking, as far as I'm concerned. You know, that would justify, should I say, is what I was looking for. Justify this type of ranking. No, he hasn't. But... Yeah, that's one of the things that they do, all the sanctioned bodies do that I really don't like is giving former champions a really high ranking when they haven't done anything lately. So anyway, I'll leave it there. Let me know what you guys think about Lawrence O'Colley's move up to heavyweight and signing with Frank Warren. What do you think Frank Warren intends to do with Lawrence O'Colley? Is he going to try and guide him to success or is he going to try and use him as cannon fodder for some of his other heavyweights? Maybe if the... Um, AJ Dubois fight, the rematch doesn't happen. Will Frank Warren look to match Dubois with Lawrence Okolli? I already mentioned that. Maybe he'll look to match Fabio Wardley with Lawrence Okolli, right? Two of his new heavyweight signings fighting each other, maybe get a higher ranking. If not with the WBC, then perhaps with one of the other sanctioned bodies because Fabio Wardley, for example, he's ranked number seven with the WBC. Go over here. He's ranked number 12 with the IBF. And he's also ranked number eight with the WBO. So, you know, we'll see if that is a match that Frank Warren looks to make. Or again, a Kali Zhang, uh, a Kali Caballel, a Kali versus, where's he at now? Uh, it could be a Jagbar, a Tauma. How about that? If a Tauma gets past Dempsey McKean, is that what Frank Warren will be looking to do? Match Moses a Tauma with Lawrence Okoli? They've sparred many times in the past as well. So I'm sure Atama would be confident in that fight. Maybe Lawrence O'Colly would as well. So anyway, I'll leave it there properly this time. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Don't forget to like the video, share it, subscribe if you haven't done so already, and I'll catch you on the next one. I'm out.
Are you sick and tired of the mainstream mindset? Does the dogmatic conformity and pathological ignorance have you tearing your hair out in frustration? Then don't be alone. Come and join our brotherhood on Patreon. We stand as a beacon of reason against an army of insanity. You'll gain access to my weekly topical podcast where we take more deep dives than Jacques Cousteau on an endless variety of subjects. There's also videos, interviews, live Q&As, as well as a vast back catalog of previous episodes, including my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. You can listen via the Patreon app, or download in high quality MP3. Connect with myself and hundreds of other members in our Element chat group. There's no contract, no commitment, you can cancel at any time, and it's cheaper than a Mickey D's McMuffin. Just head to my Patreon page via the link below this video and select the tier called the Brotherhood of Reason. I'll see you over there.